Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen, amen. Without any further ado, I'd like for Brother Young to come. I want him to take his liberty, and I know that God is going to use him mightily. Amen. And uh, they, there are some uh, Sunday school literature in the bookstore. If you haven't gotten any, I encourage you to get it. Come ahead, Brother Young. Thank you, Brother Mangrum, and praise God, everybody. I have been in the ministry for about 65 years, and this is the first time in two years that I've been in a pulpit. So it's good to be back home. This week I was reflecting on some of the experiences in my life and I have written down some of the crucial moves in my ministry in my life. Number one is being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins. Number two, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave me the utterance. And then accepting the call to be a preacher of the gospel and then serving as an evangelist with the young evangelistic trio, we traveled over most of America. And then uh, number five, marrying Janice Williams. And then number seven, serving as the editor of three different magazines. And then number eight, and this is major in my life, accepting the invitation by Bishop to serve as the pastoral elder of Emmanuel Pentecostal Church. Those are eight uh, cr crucial and strategic moves in my, in my life. So, without further ado, I'm going to open the Word of God and uh, try, with the help of the Holy Ghost, to minister to you. I invite you to turn with me to the book of Psalms, and I'm going to be reading verses 71 and 72 in Psalm 119. The psalmist said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Now, that's a, that's a startling statement. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. In other, in other words, he was saying, whatever it takes for me to be obedient to your word, that's, that, that's good for me. And then he went on to say, the law of thy mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. I took the time to uh, look that up in the message paraphrase of the book of Psalms, and this is the way it reads in the message. My troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. And so with, the, with, that, uh, with those uh, passages from the Word of God, let me get started here. And let me start by saying, everybody has problems. And the title of this uh, lesson today is A Problem is a Valuable Thing to Waste. And everybody has them. Saints have problems. Sinners have problems. Super hyper spiritual people have problems. And totally carnal people have problems. Rich people have problems. Poor people have uh, problems. Dumb people have problems. And smart people have problems. That covers the basis. I read a message on a marquee several years ago that said, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and make bad decisions. Anybody ever acted stupidly? I'm not stupid, but I've done some stupid things in my life. Now, I want to be honest with you today, and honesty demands that we admit that godly people, spiritual, on fire for God people, 
have financial problems. We have relationship problems. We sometimes have emotional problems. We have psychological problems. We have physical problems. And we have spiritual problems. But while we are in the midst of a problem, sometimes we wonder, God, is there any rhyme or reason to the problem that I'm going through, that I'm experiencing? And we wonder sometimes, at least I do, if there's a divine design behind what we are experiencing. And if so, what can I learn from what I'm going through? This seemingly totally negative situation in my life. What can I learn from it? Now, I want to, I want to uh, take another step and say that there are two basic approaches to dealing with problems. The first approach, we can view life as a series of problem-solving challenges. Now, if we follow that model, our focus will be on removing the problem regardless of why the problem came in the first place. And a lot of people, some people, attempt to fix problems by filing for bankruptcy, filing for a divorce, or resorting to some other quick fix response. Now, the second approach is to try to figure out if God has a purpose, a plan, a design behind the problem. And the title of this lesson today is a problem is a valuable thing to wait. And so we need to try to figure out why we are going through a problem. I'm saying that there is a positive potential in uh, most of life's problems if we can figure out what that uh, potential is. And I'm also saying that God does not want us to solve the problem that we're going through until he has had the opportunity to use that problem to teach us a vital spiritual lesson. How many of you have ever learned a lesson from a problem? Raise your hand. That Everybody's raising their hand. Unfortunately, we mortals so often fail to see how God wants to use problems uh, for, for good in our lives. And invariably, the inevitable problems we face, watch this, will either defeat us or they will develop us. I want the problems to develop me, not defeat me. I don't want to def uh, uh, live a defeated life. And uh, it just depends on how we respond to the problem. Sometimes we act uh, foolishly and we resent our problems rather than uh, pausing to consider what benefit those problems might bring to our lives. Now, I need to just slow down a little bit here and, and explain that though God is not the author of all the problems we experience, I need to emphasize that nothing, everybody say nothing, Nothing can happen to us without his permission. He may not be the author of it, but it's not going to happen to us unless he permits it. We need to understand that God has a purpose behind every problem that he either permits or that he authors. We fail to grasp God's grand scheme, his grand purpose behind every problem that we face, then the problem is totally wasted and a problem is a valuable thing to waste. I don't want to waste my problems. And since I'm going to have problems until I die, it makes a lot of sense to me to try to understand how God wants to use those problems to work for my good. Paul said in Romans 828, we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, uh, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, I love God, and I'm called according to his purpose, and because of that, I can know that all things are going to work together for my good. Everybody say amen. amen. I, I was thinking about what I just said to you, and I reflected back to an Old uh, Testament story uh, David, I love this, David used Goliath's own sword to cut off Goliath's head. Don't you love it? He used Goliath's sword to take his head off. And God sometimes allows us to use the problems that the devil sends our way to defeat the devil. Praise God. Now, I'm feeling better than I thought I was going to feel. So in this lesson today, 
I'm going to give you five ways that God uses the problems that we face to work for our ultimate good. God uses, watch this now. God uses problems to direct us. God uses problems to inspect us. God uses problems to correct us. God use, uh, uses uh, problems to protect us. And God uses problems to perfect us. Direct, inspect, correct, protect, and perfect. Those are the five ways that God uses problems in our lives. So let's get started with number one. God uses problems to direct us. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 10, 23, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. How many of us know that? It's not in me to, to direct my steps. It's not in you to direct your steps. And the message paraphrase says, I know, God, that mere mortals can't run their own lives. Isn't that true? I can't run my own life. That men and women don't have what it takes to, t uh, to take charge of life. The psalmist said in the Psalms 37 and 23, the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Now, if I want God to be pleased with the direction of my life, and I certainly do, then I must allow God to direct my steps. And in ordering my steps, in directing my steps, God sometimes sends a problem our way to get us moving in the right direction. That's happened in my life, and if I were to ask you to raise your hand, and if you were honest, you'd have to raise your hand and say, yes, God has sent problems in my life to get me moving in the right direction. God's purpose in the problems that we face is to point us into a new direction and to motivate us to change our behavior. And when I find myself bogged down uh, in a problem, I need to ask myself the following three questions. Number one, is God trying to get my attention? Number two, is God trying to redirect my life? And number three, does God have some purpose in allowing this problem to come into my life? David said in Psalm 23 and 3, He leadeth me in the, uh, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And the, uh, the wise man said in Proverbs 20, uh, 30, and this is the good news translation, he said, sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand but if you were honest, everybody in this room would have to raise your hand and say that there have been painful situations in my life that caused me to change the way I was living. Number two, God uses problems to inspect us. Everybody ins say inspect. That's the last time I'm going to ask you to repeat after me unless I change my mind. Someone said we humans are like tea bags. To know what's inside us, just drop us into hot water. Ever, anybody ever been in hot water? What does our reaction to the problems that we face reveal about us? So without going into a detailed explanation to prove it, let me just say here that Job's problems brought some things to the surface that he had not even admitted to himself. Several years ago, I did a, a deep dive into the book of Job and was amazed at the truths that came boiling out of the book of Job, uh, things that uh, have helped me uh, in my life. Early in the book of Job, it is said, in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. That's Job 122. And uh, then later on in Job 220, in all this, uh, did not Job sin with his lips? But as Job's problems rapidly escalated, he lashed out in frustration and anger to the point of even cursing the day of his birth, and he even second-guessed God. That's Job. So let me ask you a rhetorical question. Has God ever tested your faith with a problem? I know the answer to that. If you've lived on this earth more than two minutes, God has tested your faith with a problem. The apostle James said... James 1, verses 2 and 3 in the New uh, Century Version. When you have many kinds of troubles, you should be full of joy. Wow. 
If you're full of many troubles, you should be full of joy because you know these troubles test your faith and this will give you, give you patience. The message paraphrase says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed and not deficient in any way. That's a paraphrase. The Apostle Paul said in uh, Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, I'm reading from the Living Bible here, we can rejoice too when we run into problems. That's why I said a problem is a valuable thing to, to wait. We too can run into problems and trials, and for we know that they're good for us. You hear what I just read from the Holy Bible? Problems and trials are good for us. They help us to learn to be patient. And patience, Paul said, develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time we use it until finally our hope and faith are strong and steady. Jesus Christ said in Luke uh, 25, 19, in your patience possess ye your souls. My dad was a preacher all of my life. He traveled all over the world, literally. My mom and my dad did. And uh, my dad said that he asked God to give him patience, but then he took back that prayer request. He took it back when he realized that the Bible says tribulation works patience. Number three, God uses problems to correct us. Everybody say correct us. Some of the lessons we learn, we learn only through the chastisement of pain and failure. The writer of the book of Hebrews said, and, uh, and this is a lengthy reading, and I'm not going to apologize for reading the Bible from a Pentecostal pulpit. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. He said, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you, my sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom the Father does not discipline. If you are left without discipline, in which we, uh, all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have, an earthly, we have earthly fathers who have disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for good, that we may share in his holiness. That's powerful. For the moment, all discipline seems rather painful than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by that. I read that and I said, wow. I want everybody to say, wow. wow. Say it backwards. Wow. Sharing in the holiness of God comes as a result of passing the tests and the trials that we go through. That's what the Bible teaches. Psalms 119.71, the psalmist said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but everybody here in this room has learned things because of the things that you have gone through. The Living Bible paraphrase puts it this way. It was the best thing that could have happened to me for it taught me to pay attention to your laws. The message paraphrase says uh, in Psalm 119 verses 71 and verse uh, 72, my troubles turned out all the best uh, for all the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. Number four, God uses problems to protect us. 
a problem actually can be a blessing in disguise if it protects us from something more serious. I read about a man one time who was fired for refusing to do something that an, uh, uh, an unethical boss had, uh, had uh, told him to do. At first, this man probably saw his unemployment as a problem, but as it turned out, it saved him from going to prison one year later when his boss, uh, the actions of his boss uh, were uncovered. Joseph said to his brothers in Genesis 15 and uh, 20 in the NIV, you intended harm for me, but God intended it for good. One, uh, one commentator said, it is not clear how long Joseph was in prison, but we can deduce that the total time of his service to Potiphar and his imprisonment was about 11 years. Think about that. About 11 years. So God, almighty God, sovereign God, used these mind-numbing uh, problems of Joseph, and they were, they were unfair. They seemed to be unfair. But God used these problems to protect a nation that was in the making. I believe with all of my heart that God will use our problems to protect us from ourselves, and he will also use those problems to protect us from everything that the devil can throw at us. Amen. Number five, and uh, God uses problems to perfect us. Psalms 138 and 8. The psalmist said, the Lord will perfect or complete that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. Let me read that from three other versions. The uh, English Standard Version says, the Lord will fulfill his purpose in me. I want God to do that in my life. I think God has a purpose for my life. And I want him to fulfill his purpose in my life. Whatever that takes. The Living Bible uh, paraphrase says, the Lord will work out his plans for my life. Did you know God has a plan for your life? And the Amplified Version says, the Lord will accomplish that which concerns me. So it just boils down to this. Problems, when we respond to them correctly, build character and they complete us. I want my character to be completed and I want God to complete his work in my life. I'm 83 years old. I don't look like it. I don't act like it. I don't sound like it. I'm 83 years old, but God's not through with me yet. That's why I'm in this pulpit right now. We need to come to terms. I'm getting excited. We need to come to terms with the fact that God is far more interested in our character than he is in our comfort. I don't mean to be too negative, but I'm going to say it anyhow. Consumer Christianity has taken front and center stage in our what's-in-it-for-me culture. Consumer Christianity has nothing to do with this Bible. Because consumer Christianity is all about my comfort. Everybody say my comfort. Consumer Christianity is all about my pleasure. Everybody say my pleasure. Consumer Christianity is all about my needs. Everybody say my needs. Consumer Christianity is all about my wants and all about my expectations. You thought I was going to ask you to repeat after me. That's a foolish. I'm feeling real mischievous today. <laughs> Let me just boil it down and say that consumer Christianity says that I deserve this, I deserve that, or I deserve the other. Authentic Christianity, on the other hand, is all about me being in Christ and about Christ being formed in me and about me partaking of God's holiness and about being everything that Jesus wants me to become. Amen. That's what authentic Christianity is all about. Not about my comfort. It is impossible 
I want to stress that. It is absolutely impossible for me to know what all of my spiritual needs are. But God knows what I need. And my God will meet all of my needs in his own sovereign way. Not in my way, but in his own sovereign way. Even if that means challenging my comfort zone and sending me blessings disguised as problems because a problem is a valuable thing to waste. My relationship with God and my character, I'm going to say that slowly, my relationship with God and my character are the only two things that I'm going to be able to take with me into eternity. My character and my relationship with God. I want to have a relationship with God. I don't want to just, I don't want to, I don't want to just come to church and show up. I want to have a, relation, a dynamic, vital, spiritual relationship with God. My God is always at work in my life, even when I don't recognize it, even when I don't understand it, and even when I do not enjoy it. I'm go, I, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here, but I'm going through a pretty critical time in my life. I have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, and uh, God's helping me. I try to keep active, and I ride my bike uh, uh, pretty often, up to th- three or four miles. I ride by, by brother, uh, my friend's house every time I take a ride. And almost every time I take a ride. And so God is always at work in our lives, even when we don't recognize it, even when we don't understand it, and even when we don't enjoy it. It is much easier to carry on when we realize that God's purpose is to make everything work together for our good. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. But the fulfillment of that promise pivots on our loving God and being called according to his purpose. And when we believe that, when we accept that, it is easier for us to cooperate with God and enjoy to the fullest the benefits of every trial and every hardship that we go through. Now, I want you to understand that when I say what I just said, I'm not talking about just simply having a stiff upper lip fatalism about the problems that we go through. I'm talking about believing that God has a purpose for our lives. How many believe that God has a purpose for your life? And because he loves us as as his children, does God love you as his child? He will refine us. I'm going to say it slow. He will refine us in the white hot heat of the trials that we experience. Job said in Job 23 verses 8 through 10, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. He knoweth, (laughs) I'm about to run right now, but he knows the way I take. And when he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to take the time to read something that our oldest granddaughter, Liesl Adams, Posted on Facebook. She says in this post, I encountered a woman whose son was shot and killed in Houston. I asked her how she was doing and her response was, I'm hurting, but I'm still blessed. I'm hurting, but I'm still blessed. She goes on to say, this woman who had just experienced one of life's greatest pains somehow sees the bigger picture. Just wow, 
Lisa said. Sometimes I get so caught up in myself and my problems that I fail to remember that I'm still blessed. Being blessed, she writes, isn't predicated upon what I do or don't do, have or, or what does, uh, what I do have and what I don't have, or what does or doesn't happen to me. Excuse me. It's, she continues, it's based on the fact that I'm loved and accepted by God. Praise God. I'm loved and I'm accepted by God. She goes on and she says, it's based on the fact that God is in control and his plan is perfect even when it may not make sense to me. A problem is a valuable thing to waste. But she continues in this post. So, so today, despite our hurts and life's difficulties and despite our losses, may we all realize and remember that we are all still blessed. If you feel that you're blessed, raise your hand and thank God for the blessings that he's heaped upon your life. Amen. Praise God. I have the time to read the lyrics of some old songs. Some of, many of you, if not most of you, are familiar with these words. Through it all, I've, been, I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave me consolation that my trials came to make me strong. And then another song that we used to sing goes like this. We are often tossed and driven on the restless sea of times. Somber skies and howling tempests oft succeed, succeed a bright sunshine. In th that land of perfect day, when the mists have rolled away, we'll understand it better by and by. The chorus goes like this. By and by... When the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we'll tell the story of how we've overcome, for we'll understand it better by and by. It goes like this on the second stanza. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die, for we'll understand it better by and by. Praise God. I'm going to read the lyrics of a song that I have sung for many, many decades. I am persuaded. It goes like this. When life's troubles o'er me sweep, when the waters are too deep, though the road is rough and steep, he'll see me through. Oh, thank God of this, I'm sure. With his help I shall endure, for his promise is secure. His word is true. The chorus goes like this. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall separate me from the love of God which is in Christ. The third stanza, when my body's filled with pain and I'm tempted to complain, though my spirits start to wane, he'll see me through. So whatever comes my way, I will trust him, I will pray. And with Paul, you'll hear me say, thy words are true. Shall we stand? And let's thank God for his blessings that he's heaped upon our lives. Thank you for your blessings, God. Thank you for trusting us with the trials that we go through. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. I love you, Jesus, because you first loved me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. Thank you for your attention.
tremendous word that we heard from Brother Young today. I'm so thankful that he uh, took the time to come and minister to us today. It was wonderful. It was enlightening. It was inspiring. <clears throat> and it helps you understand a lot of what you're going through. When someone just comes and brings out the word of God and explains it to us, it helps us in our life and it helps us to live. Man, I'm thankful today. I won't say I'm thankful for problems, but I'm thankful that God brings me through them and that God uses them to develop me. One thing I, I saw years ago in the Highland Park uh, cafeteria, a little sign that they had up there and said, Life's a grinding stone. Some people it polishes, some people it wears down. And if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, if you believe that all things work together for good, just know God is shining you to be one of his jewels. Amen. God bless you. Take a few minutes to take a break. Come back for the morning worship service. We're looking forward to it. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.